Welcome to Eggs the Podcast, featuring the best and brightest minds in business leadership, entrepreneurship, and technology. Today, we are thrilled to have John Edmonds Cosma, Meta Media Partner and CEO of Bang Productions. John is an executive producer, entrepreneur, and thought leader in the entertainment industry, with more than 20 years' experience working on both sides of the camera. He is a subject matter expert in tech and entertainment and has collaborated with talented people such as writer and director Nick Casavides, world renowned DJ Armin Van Buren, and American professional motorsports competitor Travis Pastrana. Today, we'll be discussing his take on finding a perfect audience, what it takes to become a meta media partner, his company's impact on the comedy industry, and so much more. Please join us in welcoming to the show, John Edmonds Cosma. Hey, John, welcome to the show, man. Dig great on the name, man. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, you never know. I mean, sometimes you get these names. I mean, yours doesn't seem that difficult, right? But then as soon as I say it a couple times into the microphone, I start going, oh, crap. Maybe it's Cosma. Maybe it's, yeah. you know, something strange and, and foreign to me. And I'm saying up. it totally wrong. So uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, he yeah. slaughtered one two weeks ago. So yeah, I got it. Uh, but in my defense, the guy was Lebanese and I have very little experience with that one. <laughs> so not entirely my fault. Well, John, let's kind of kick off, uh, you know, I mean, we obviously gave a little bit of a tease to who you are, but let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, or a little more about who you are. Let's talk about your your background experience and what you're doing today with Bang. Uh, I mean, really, <clears throat> really, we developed a model um, from 2016 when I really dove deep into social media. We basically developed a model of a studio, um, you know, a, a 50s, 60s, you know, Paramount Pictures model. Um, because it's, um, you know, it, when Clint Eastwood came into Paramount, I think it was in the 60s, you know, they had marketing, they had PR, um, they had distribution, they had production. They had everything, you know, uh, talent could want in-house. Uh, and that's how the studio systems started. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel. I'm just using technology to uh, re reinvent the studio model, which I call a micro studio. I, I consider us a micro studio. Um, but a lot of people, you know, look at me uh, sometimes as management, but we're more, uh, we're, we're more of a studio type of deal. Okay. Well, let's talk a little bit about how that then works with a client. So for example, if you've got an entertainment client, I mean, and I'd, I'd love to maybe dig into this story about uh, your uh, ideation or your concept that sort of was a big shift socially for, for comedy. So maybe that would be a good story to start with. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, I was in television and I first, and I, I <clears throat> let me start over. I was in television and um, just partnered with a guy named Chris case. And we were going to start a company and we were going to start developing shows. And I think I developed about a thousand shows and sold three. Um, and I was, you know, I was still trying to make it as a producer. I was partners in the film industry with Nick Cassavetes for two years, you know, did that whole thing, had an office in the Taft building um, on the corner of Hollywood and Vine before the W was built uh, and I actually had Mick Jagger's old office. Um, oh, nice. That's funny. Yeah, no, I actually, yeah, no, that's not a joke. Well, yeah, I used to work for a, a small record label. We had a, an office in the same building and half building. Oh, you're in the Taft building? Yeah, a million years ago, but yeah, they were called Suburban Noise Records at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah, we were in top. We had like the the four room uh, suite office up top, and I I don't know why we had that office. It was way too much. I think my partner just wanted to, you know, be a typical Hollywood uh, presenter with no money in their pockets. <laughs> type of deal. Yeah, we uh, had a, a relationship with Capitol Records, so it made sense to be right there, but. Yeah, yeah, Capitol is right there across the street. Used to go to the the bar right there on the corner. That was actually Nick Cassavetti's favorite bar right there oh, on the funny. corner there. Um is an Irish that was an Irish bar, maybe. I can't remember if it's an Irish bar or whatever, but there's a there's a bar right on that corner there. A lot of people, a lot of local Hollywood people go to. But you know, when I realized that most of the people in Hollywood were full of shit <laughs> and, and I told everybody to go fuck themselves um that's when you know it's uh that kind of ended my movie career and then <laughs> uh developed uh started developing a lot of tv shows sold three which led me to you know 
this social media thing in 2016 where I found Darren Knight. And at the time, uh, a friend of mine just signed uh, the liberal redneck, um, Trey uh, Crowder. I love that guy. He's yeah. <laughs> he's one of my favorite. <laughs> And I try and it, and they were doing they were trying to develop a lot of TV at that time, nonfiction shows at that time for these types of characters that were coming out. And I think they missed Darren. And I tried to pitch comedy um, managers. They were like, hey, you know, we'll do the content. You know, y'all help us manage him. And they're like, he doesn't need a manager. He needs five years development and so forth. And I said, screw it. I said, all right, we'll sign him. And we went to work. I think we signed him 2016, June 24th of 2016. We went to work and we did, I think we grossed $600,000 from the time I signed him to the end of that year um, through social media. And, you know, didn't know what I was doing, just, you know, created this blueprint by discovery because I, when I realized that social media gave you all the tools that a network needs, you know, uh, in, 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 I guess in real time, you know, like a full scale network, um, you have all those tools in social media. I said, hell, I'm going to make my own network. And that was what I set out to do. And we doubled down on that and, and been perfecting it ever since. And, and, be and because I didn't know the rules of comedy, uh, I did everything. I reverse engineered everything, really traditional, traditional rules of comedy. I reverse engineered every one of them and um, we were successful. And then, you know, people started copying me, I, you know, because I would sell my own tickets. I would four wall my own shows. I would market my own shows. I managed the act. I produced the shows. So. You know, I did everything myself. And um, I think Adam Genovesian at the time was at ICM. He was a young agent at ICM. He's now a manager at Levity Live. Um, I think he manages, uh, uh, I know he manages Steve O. And then uh, I always forget her name, the blonde comedian, short blonde hair, Feaster. He manages her, or whatever. And he said, what you're doing, because I had my whole business on a laptop. And he says, what you're doing is the future. Uh, and in 2018, you know, because a lot of people were duplicating what we we're doing, we took, you know, I took Darren to Just for Laughs uh, from the trailer to Toronto, the Super Bowl comedy, you know, uh, in two years. And he headlined uh, the Variety's top 10 show. And that had never been done before. And mostly it takes comedians 10 to 15 years to get there. Oh, interesting. Well, and it's funny because, I, I mean, especially now, I mean, with podcasts and things like that, I mean, obviously a lot of comedians are seeing kind of rapid growth in their industry right now. And so it's uh, it's or interesting that you were sort of ahead of the curve on some of that stuff. Can we talk a little bit about some of the strategic cho uh, choices you were making or how it was so much different than the way people were using it? I'm just curious because so many people use social media in very superficial ways and they have a hard time building audience and things like that. So maybe we could talk a little bit about audience development and, and how you you know were able to target people who would you know follow through with buying tickets and stuff. And stuff. Yeah, and, and actually let's, uh, if you can, can we break down platforms, which one performs better than others if you've, got any uh input on that uh i mean you know as far as platform you know we're on facebook you know i think facebook has your biggest conversion for ticket sales and what have you um i mean i didn't know that at the time but between facebook and instagram they their conversion you know with if you create a let me say this if you create a fan base that's a pure source the conversion on Facebook and Instagram for selling tickets um, is pr the best place to be. Um, and when I say pure source, there's a lot of fraud in the marketplace. And, and when I say fraud, so if you take an algorithm, uh, you take your pure source and then you take numbers. A lot of these people bought, you know, over time, that is the, a dilution of conversion. And, and when I realized if you create a pure source, uh, the conversion is a lot higher. 
And, and a lot of these big media companies that are out there now that I call them the Don Kings of media, you know, their conversion sucks. I mean, I've competed, I've competed against a 50 million number, um, you know, type of page to, to a, a 3 million pure source page that I built from the ground up and my conversion was higher because that, that's a big dilution when you add a lot of fake numbers in there. Yeah, yeah. If, if 60% of them are bots and the other 10% are, you know, it, it just makes sense that if 3 million people are actual fans of the person that you're promoting or tickets you're trying to sell, uh, the majority of them are actually going to follow through and buy tickets or merch or, or whatever you're selling. Yeah, and I'm probably going to do a disservice to whoever wrote it. I can't remember, but there's this concept in business about this, uh, the thousand true fans. Right. And so, and I think to your point about having a pure source that you built from the beginning, you know, and, and for comedian or entertainer uh, specifically, you know, building an audience of people who are actually your fans who will actually support you. You can go a long way with a lot lower number, uh, you know, if they're coming to every show and they're buying every t-shirt and they're, you know, doing whatever thing versus, you know, to your point, just stacking the deck with like a million people. Like who cares if there's a million people in there, if nobody's buying. Well, that's what that's what it, everything is. Nobody, everything is selling the hype, you know. And I didn't want to sell the hype, you know, because I told myself, you know, I think when we started this journey, and even before we started this journey, I said, whatever I do, you know, I have to be black or white, and whatever I say, you can write it on the wall. And when I started operating that way, that's when my business took off. And in in as far as the different things that you know that we did in comedy you know first of all it takes i'll preface this it takes great talent it takes a great talent to do what i do but if you have a great talent and then you think about the first part is all right what is that talent's narrative you know what is he what is his narrative and you know what is he trying to convey because i said if i can just give this guy an outline because i could see you know, when you think about pure, go back to pure source, when you think about authenticity, you know, even with a talent's content, a lot of times that authenticity gets diluted in Hollywood mm -hmm. and, you know, and a lot of producers want to write, rewrite someone's lines or whatever. And what I found out uh, that dilutes the relatability to the fan because it's not coming from a, the pure source of that act. Um, so that was the, that was the first thing is understanding relatability, not changing his content, just giving him a platform, giving him an outline and helping him with timing, uh, was really all I did. And he filled in the holes with real life stuff. And, and um, that was a big deal. And, and then I looked at, then I looked at, uh, you know, then I thought like a lot of these industries are kind of operate like dinosaurs because they forget who's paying, you know, these producers. And if you think about that, these producers forget who's paying the bills. Nobody gives, nobody knows the sensibilities. If somebody's wanting to see an entertainer and you have 25 people rewriting content for this entertainer, you're diluting the entertainer. You know, and, and, and in a way, when they do that, they forget who's paying the bills. And when I say know who's paying, right, um, that's that's a huge, huge deal. And I think a lot of when I say know who's paying, because when that that producer's rewriting someone's content, um, it's being a <clears throat> being a dilution. Right. I'm sorry to somebody. Somebody just. uh poke their head in apologize about that um so know who's paying when i say someone's you know working with an actor tree trying to rewrite what they are going to say right that 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 is you know i'm appeasing industry you know because i found that these industry appeases each other like if you know if i'm an actor you want to appease that producer if you're a comedian, you want to appease that, that, you know, executive or whoever. And that environment gets so wrapped up, you know, in that process, they forget who actually is, you know, paying them and supporting their lifestyle. Exactly. Um, that was a 
that was a big deal as well. So um, uh, I, I, I actually, I worked in radio for a short stint and I, I went through this period where they were trying to shoehorn me in a position I didn't want to go. And I ended up quitting over it. And so I can completely relate to that portion of things because it, having lived it and having, you know, my own kind of credo, my own kind of map that I want to go down. I hate trying to conform to this guy's idea of who I am and that guy's idea of who he wants me to be and so on and so forth. It just doesn't work. It it, it kind of muck, muddies up the waters and, and makes it more of a inauthentic product. And so I, I can, can totally relate to that. Yeah, I would just add too that you know the the idea of authenticity is one of these things that marketing companies and stuff talk about like it's something we can manufacture, right? Like we're gonna we're gonna talk to an audience in a way that feels authentic or seems authentic, you know, that kind of thing. When authenticity is to your point, just what comes out of the person's mouth. So, mm -hmm. you know, and it doesn't mean that people can't be trained or taught, or maybe there is a better way to deliver a message. You know, I, I mean there can be truth in all those things. But I think what you're talking about as dilution is a is a really great point because I think for a lot of people, and I'm sure this, you know, this kind of capture probably happens all the time in Hollywood. If you're the young artist just trying to make it and you found a producer that'll pay attention to you, it's probably really easy to just go with the flow or, you know, accept whatever management or leadership is telling you. So staying truly authentic to yourself, you know, not only creates better relationships in in life, but you know, between you and your your uh potential customer or your buyer. So well, I mean, when you think about it too, you think about, you know, social media, you know, well, you know, if, if it's a pure source on social media, it's a casting call that's already been done for you, you know, and all these things that, that I, I realized entertainment, you know, how it translates to the BNB world is just phenomenal because I think, you know, I think, you know, most corporations, most major corporations are 30 years behind the curve. And they're usually off 20 to 30 percent on who their true customer is. Because if you have a CEO who's putting out a creative because of how they feel, um, that's a disconnect on who they're the sensitivities of a true customer. Or if you have a marketing company doing your creative who comes in and does, does a case study, um, you know, of a hundred people, that's not a big enough number to determine a pure source and what's going to appeal to um, their customer or build, build a customer base the right way. That's a dilution and waste of money. So when you bring all these fractional pieces of business to the table in the corporate world, uh, they're so far off base because even, even training, you know, these training companies come into these corporations they have no idea what the sense they do a hundred people case study and they have no idea what the sensibilities of the corporation are. And the corporations don't even know what the sensibilities are of their own business, you know? Uh, and I don't know, you know, like with my process, I could eliminate 40% of any fractional business in any corporation and redesign their whole business. And, and, it would be times 10 to the bottom line at the end of the day. But it's, you know, and when I tell people this, you know, translating this information from entertainment to the corporate world, when I tell people this, they look at me like I have three heads, you know, but if they really, really understood about what pure source means, um, they wouldn't look at me like that, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, I, and I think it's a time and you see there's so much bullshit. I think it's a time to, you know, if, if you're birthing a business or rebirthing a business, it's time because if you don't do it now, all the narratives are gone. All the bullshit's been said. So if we don't reset or start building things properly, then you're just not going to make it. Yeah, no, it's funny. I mean, you bring up sort of a, a interesting philosophical or philosophy. Yeah, why can't I say that? Philosoph <laughs> philosophy. Philosoph philosophical uh, point. Oh. <laughs> Oof. God, you can tell we've done a couple shows today. Um, <laughs> so but you bring up a great point in that um, social media, I think, started out with good intentions, right? The idea was, hey, this is a way for you to interact with other people. This is a way for you to stay in touch with folks that you don't see. 
uh, all these things, right? And it evolved. And granted, some people have stayed true all the way through. But I mean, there's definitely an evolution in social media where people have become performers. And, you know, I mean, it, my fa- one of my favorite Instagram accounts is called uh, Influencers in the Wild. And you get to watch <laughs> all, the, all these people, you know, with their selfies or, you know, doing the TikTok dance or whatever, you know, just in public, right? And it's become like very performative, right? There's always the dude posing in front of the Lamborghini that was just out front of the Starbucks. It's not his car you know, or there's, you know, so you've created it, not you, but like the world has created all these sort of false narratives, false expectations, false ideas of what it means to be alive. Right. Because we're using Instagram to share our lives, but we're only sharing the key moments or the the time that we do walk in front of somebody's really nice car or whatever it is. And so I think that there's a lot of that, that for a while was really appealing to people. Like, I think it worked and it drew an audience and people paid attention to it. But now, you know, back to our point or our discussion about authenticity, the the whole thing has changed. Like we're seeing through all these things now and we're going, okay, well, that that's not what we want. That's not how we live. That's not what we are. And the people that seem to be doing the best on social media are the people who are staying true and authentic. And I think that it's interesting because in this world of all this amazing technology and all these different advertising channels and different ways of doing marketing and, you know, all this tech. It seems like everything has to be wildly complicated, but to the first thing you said, I mean, it was just be black and white. Like it's, it's go back to basics is really the secret, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I mean, well, and you think about if you look at ourselves, if you look at ourselves as human beings, when you talk about whatever that projection is or whatever your, whatever narrative you want to convey, because Hollywood did get messed up a little bit because a lot of talent, they because there was a lot of fraud and numbers out there, Hollywood got so excited, they jumped on those numbers. And they didn't think about who could convert the stage or who could convert the camera because they got burned on a lot of people they couldn't convert. So if you're out there making content and you're not being true with yourself, you're trying to put yourself in another space that doesn't really fit who you are. That's where you see the bullshit and the content. Mm -hmm. If someone's true to themselves and they're conveying that truth on social media, I think that's what's shining through now. And it's a little bit easier to figure out who's going to be that person to convert the stage or camera, if that makes sense. So there has been an evolution. So you're, you're dead on with that but that's basically what that is you know it's like people got to be true to themselves that to be authentic with themselves and then convey that same thing to the world and people can recognize that yeah well and that gives people the opportunity to know if you're full of shit or if you are who you say you are in which yeah. case you know it's it's free for me to give you this quick easy like or whatever thumb up you on on social but it's different when you're asking me to reach into my wallet and so if you ring of a little inauthentic or, you know, whatever. I give you a like because, you know, you asked for one or because your picture was cool. But like a, a true fan, that does not make, right? Like, I mean, this person, you know, so to your point about conversion, it's just like, if the person, if, if you as a human can sniff out the inauthenticity in somebody, it, it makes it really tough to open your wallet or get to that next step. So I, I think you're right. And I think for a while there's, you know, I mean, there was an era when people were hiring their 14 year old nephew because he knew how to run Twitter, you know, and these kids are running social media accounts for giant agencies and stuff. And it's, you know, I mean, they know how to use the platform, but they don't think strategically, they don't do any of this other stuff, but it was like, but I got a million likes. That's, isn't that something I got a million likes, you know, but mm-hmm. who cares if those million people don't do anything? Well, <clears throat> well, I think society too conveys this hollowness, You know, and I think we're in a pattern and I've had this rationale and I say this a lot. Um, When I looked at subconscious, right, and understanding what subconscious is, and then I looked at unconscious bias and understanding what that is, and then looking at consciousness and understanding what that is. Now, when scientists determine these things, when they look, they were focused in on your subconscious They can identify what that is. But a lot of people don't realize that science is a one lane highway. And if you're focused on a topic or ideology, whatever it is, the rules of science are not going to let you out of that lane to connect the dots. 
which is bullshit. That's the flaw in science uh, because they're a one lane highway. Um, but when you take those three pieces and you, you understand how your subconscious is being programmed, you know, when we're brought into this world, right. And, and then we get to a certain point in life where we start responding to things based on that programming in our subconscious in our un with our unconscious bias, because we're responding to things, you know, naturally just because of what we've been programmed to do. So however thick that programming is, and what, if you don't know what that is, that's why people get, can't get to consciousness. So <clears throat> when you'd apply that to society, I mean, that's playing out daily. It's whether you took a job because you needed to make money and you don't give a shit about the job. You wake up 15 years later and you're like, what the hell am I doing here? You know, because you were pressured by the Western part of the world to get a job, you know, to support yourself. This is what the perfect thing looks like. So that kind of emulates that, that, that process right there. And if you apply that to a business, you know, businesses can't get to consciousness because of all the bullshit They've been programmed over the years through their subconscious. You know, they're not willing to change. They're not, you know, because of these, you know, they're not willing to change dramatically because of these patterns of business. Because that's why you're going to see a lot of major corporations filing bankruptcy in the next five years because of this exact thing. Because, but if you think about it from the time we're born and, and how human beings emulate that hollowness, through whatever they do, that plays out linearly through society on a daily basis. Yeah, there's a, a lot of that. You know, we do things the way we do things because we've always done things that way. You know, and you see it in business, especially, you know, in these big corporations that are, are these behemoths. You know, a lot of people compare them to dinosaurs because they're big and slow. And that's right, because, you know, it, it's difficult to pivot this giant ship, right, and, and chase every new fad or every new whatever. So you just kind of do things the way you always did. And, you know, to our, you know, a, I think to be an effective business leader or to run a new company or to stay competitive sort of in the future, you know, I think you're right that there's got to be some expansion of this, you know, understanding. I would say that one of the bigger challenges, though, for most people is what if they don't recognize they have a problem? So they, they behave a certain way, they act a certain way, they seem to be getting some rewards, maybe they're making money and surviving. But I, any advice for the person who maybe doesn't even know that they are, you know, under, underneath this sort of, I don't, I, I don't want to call it brainwashing, but, you know, under this sort of way of doing things because we've always done it that way. Don't well, realize they're not. Yeah, oh, go ahead. We... I was going to say they they just don't realize that they're being inauthentic, that they're, they're doing their their day-to-day -day thing, but not being themselves. I think that's, uh, you know, with the, with social media and with Instagram and Facebook and everything like that, I think people put on this facade and then after a while, it's not a facade They're it, They think that's who they are, but really they're, it, it, they're not. And so um, I was trying to add on to Ryan's point of view, how can they kind of step back and, and see that, that maybe they're not being authentic, you know? Well, when you internalize all that stuff, are you happy? Are you doing really what comes from the heart? Are you doing what really gets you excited? And I think when you internalize those situations on who you are as a person and only that person is going to know, and he's that person, you know, whether he's successful or not, they're probably not going to tell anybody else, but they know if they're happy or not. And they know if they're happy about what they're doing. And I, and I think that's, that's how you're going to, that's how you tell, you know, yeah. be honest with yourself. Are you happy? Do you feel good? You know, is this what you want to do for the rest of your life? You know, are you doing this just because, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I, I think, think that's right. And, uh, but I, I think it's also, you know, really challenging for people to dig that deep and be honest with themselves. You know, I mean, like I can even speak from my own experience to some extent, you know, there were a lot of years where I behaved a certain way in business because I believed it was the way I was supposed to be. In fact, even the, the name of our company, uh, back in the day, and we've sort of evolved it a little bit, but the way we named our company in the first place was because we felt like, Hey, this is what a business in that world should sound like. 
So it wasn't like a business name we loved or any of that kind of stuff. It was just like, hey, you know, other companies like us sound like this. So if we want to be one of them, we need to be one of them. Right. And so it didn't come from a place, uh, you know, of your heart or your mind or anything else. It was literally trying to blend in. Right. That was kind of the move. And so and I imagine for a lot of people, uh, to Mike's point, too, you know, it's it's really hard to uncover, you know, what is happiness if you're not sure. Right. Because, I mean, you know, there's this so superficial version of happiness, which is you're smiling and laughing and spending the day doing whatever. And maybe you are happy. But it's, you know, but to understand what is happiness in the frame of, am I happy doing what I'm doing, all that stuff? I, I imagine there's some inner dialogue where people go, okay, I'm not happy doing what I'm doing. But for a lot of people, I think they just kind of toe the line, you know, and and maybe this is as happy as we get, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I have, you know, or I'm curious, and, and obviously, you know, these kinds of things require a lot of, you know, uh, work on ourselves and things like that to overcome. But, um, but I think that that's where a lot of the challenges are is like, it, as Mike said, you know, we might think we're being honest if we're, though we're not really being honest, we're being wildly influenced and we just don't even know. Well, you, the, the key point there, this is something I've seen come to the surface as well. Uh, the key point there is what you thought you should look like or what you anticipated, or, you know, or your assumption, your anticipation, whatever you want to call it, what things are supposed to look like. Right. And, when you think about that and you and you, you you talk about the human experience and you talk about social media and how these things are so intertwined when you think about these young people's you know 20s and 30s even in their teens or whatever what what I've seen playing out in society is that mindset by by default has created this you know non confidence type of human being because what's happening now is these people are going down this road and they see social media, they see some, how somebody dresses, they see how much money they make, you know, all the pretty shit, right? So they don't see the struggles like a true, a true person, unless you inherited a bunch of money, a true successful person had to work their ass off. You're not seeing that story of working your ass off is not being portrayed in the past 10 years, there's no heroes anymore. Right. So these kids see this. So these kids are trying to make this perfect box before they do something. I got to do this. I got to make this perfect look before I go do this. And, and they're never going to, they're never going to get anywhere because they're not going to be able to make this perfect box. And that's creating this non-confidence thing. This, you know, this, thing of uh, communication, not even being able to communicate with other people and so forth. Um, so that ideology that Western society created 25 or 100 years ago is backfiring right now and actually, you know, uh, diluting humans on, you know, what they're capable of, you know, yeah. because they're trying to make things look too damn pretty. I think that's a really good point, you know, and, and it's an interesting thing that Mike and I have learned from doing the show. I mean, you know, we've done 300 plus interviews with CEOs and startup founders and entrepreneurs, and we've run into this so many times that it's that, that 10 year overnight success, right? I mean, we're talking to them now in, in the state where they've accomplished something or they've built a business or whatever. And in our show, we have the opportunity to go back and explore those prior 10 years that actually got us there, but to sort of the new new take or the new look of things, you know, social media shows that what's happening now or in the moment. And so they do, you know, I have young boys and, and they, you know, they see these guys who are seemingly wildly successful, especially like YouTubers and meet content creators, people like this, who seemingly came out of nowhere and suddenly they're, you know, making tons of money and they're really popular. And this is really appealing for these kids, but they don't understand that for most of them, I mean, maybe there's some that, you know, I don't know, they were on Disney Channel as a kid. And so they just rolled into being famous. But, you know, but for, for you know, our, my kids generation, you know, they, they don't see the, you know, hours spent writing scripts or the, you know, going out and collecting video or starting with your phone and then buying a camera and then building the business and then hiring people. And then now I'm that famous guy, right? Like they, they mm -hmm. don't see any of that stuff. And so I think you're right to say that, there's sort of this, you know, back to this concept of false, you know, reality, we're creating this 
societal view that things can be accomplished sort of instantly. And it's just, it's not a reality. It's creating a, a world that's very tough for, for young people, especially. And, uh, you know, I, I see it even my, even in my own son, I can't, oh, what was it? He had an opportunity. He was going to go make, he's, he's 16. It would have been his first job. He was going to make, oh, it's like working construction or something, holding a flag, right? I mean, it was nothing. It's not exciting work. It's not a sexy job, but it was like $22 an hour. And he's like, well, That's you know. That's amazing for a 16 year old. Yeah. That's he's great. Like, I, he's like, I could hold out. I think I want to do something else. And I was like, hold out, hold out for what? Like, you're not even out of school yet. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're looking for a job. You can work the weekends and you 22 yeah. bucks. Like, God, I didn't get $22 an hour until I was like 30. Yeah. <laughs> you know, granted times have changed a little bit, but I was just like the way he balked at 20 bucks an hour. I was just like, Oh my God. Like, what do you think is, you know, what do you think is out there for you? Yeah. Well, that's, that's, that's a, an additional part of that delusion. You know, when, you know, when we were coming up, if we got a job for $22 an hour, we'd be like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. Yeah. No, Where that's a, well, I mean, yeah. as soon as I was making that kind of money, that's, we started our family. We, we you yeah. know, bought a house, we did all the stuff. Right. I mean, but yeah. you know, but I, I was making 20 bucks an hour. God, I was rolling in it. What would I do with all this money? Yeah. <laughs> you know? And I mean, cause I, I always tell him and he doesn't care, but when I was 16, I was making, you know, six, 10 an hour, uh, unloading trucks, like un unloading semis, you know, it's like, okay, you know, not sexy work, but Hey, I needed some money. I wanted to go out on the weekends. I need my six, 10 an hour, you know, yeah. and now this kid's got 20 bucks in his face and he's like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I mean, well, that's kind of speaks to why I came up with finding a perfect audience, because um, in my process, uh, I eliminate, you know, I eliminate the emotional part and it's all data driven, you know, and there's nothing in the marketing space that's 100 percent data driven. And even in, in the, here's the misconception, you know, everybody's hot on this AI thing. Unless you fix the sources before you implement this AI, you're still going to be off 20, mm -hmm. 30 percent because the all the AI is going to do is, you know, replicate the data that's on the surface. Mm -hmm. Right. So if, if, AI, if, if a company uses AI and they haven't <clears throat> restructured and understood who their true customer is the right way, their, their AI is even going to be off. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, think, and, I think that's right. Yeah. That's what nobody's thinking about as well. well so, especially when you look at like the chat GPT, for example, I mean, it's basically just ingested the internet, right? So you yeah. feel like it's all knowing, but the thing that the internet uh, or the GPT in particular and other AI platforms do is, they exude supreme confidence, even if they're saying total bullshit. <laughs> and so if, you, mm -hmm. if you're not being objective and you're not looking at what, the, what it's outputting for you, it might sound like it knows what it's talking about. And maybe it does, but it also really might not. Yeah. So with my finding a perfect audience, I eliminate the emotional part. It's all data driven. So this this actually would eliminate marketing because I think I think marketing is reactionary and data is precise, you know, exactly. and, there's nothing, and there's nothing in the marketing space that ever has ever been driven by data. And, and that's what my book and my process uh, talks about and shows companies, you know, how to do it, whether you need to rebirth or birth your any type of business with with content. Well, yeah. So let's maybe dig into that process a little bit more, this idea of finding your perfect audience. I mean, I think a lot of people go out into business thinking they know who they're talking to, right? You know, and to your point about like sort of the emotional aspects, right? It's like, oh, well, I love this product. So people who are like me would love this product. So there we go. That's my audience. Or maybe I want to go out and open a business, but we're we're selling to everyone, right? And And for most of us, we know that selling to everyone is like selling to no one. So, mm -hmm. so could we talk a little bit about just, you know, actually getting into the weeds a little bit on this process of un uncovering who your audience is. Well, it, you know, it, everybody wants to shoot, you know, shoot, shoot fish in a, I don't know, I, I wouldn't say a barrel, sh you know, shoot fish in an ocean. Everybody wants to shoot fish in an ocean for that one deal. And, you know, the future of social media is finding a position of influence, you know, you got to establish a position of influence on social media. 
And, and you can do that by not selling anything. So if you, whatever space you're in, you want to garner as much space as you can right now, because like there's real, there's real space here on earth, you know, and then there's real space on the internet. So uh, a position of influence is a big deal and you can build that position of influence by law of attraction. And that's, that's it. It's law of attraction. So if you, if you work in education or whatever space it is, and you have current content, you know, we're going to start with current content that you have. We're going to put that out there. Let's see who responds to this current content. But the content I'm going to put out there is going to be relatable, educational, and entertaining. That's it. I'm not trying to sell them anything, whether you're a business, whether you're an entertainer, whatever it is, I'm going to put that content out in my space. And then by law of attraction, see who is going to start to respond, right? And when you start to see this response, you start collecting data, right? And as you're collecting data, the bigger number you get, you wouldn't start homing in on that top 20 to 30% and start catering your content that's relatable, educational, entertaining to that top 20 to 30%. And you keep doubling down on that process and you start to build your foundation with your foundation, you know, of the data, who, who the people are, you bring them into your socials and bring them into your house. And, and that, as that foundation develops, as numbers grow, you start to see what the sensibilities are, right. With this foundation. So as you're bringing all the data in, you're homing down on that 20 to 30% of the data, you're building this foundation. You start to see how the sensitivities are, at, you know, how you're going to communicate, right? This is how I'm going to communicate. And I'll, I'll tell you, I'll show you why this is important. And a lot of people don't realize, especially in this day and time. So I found out that with my process, the number one avatar in the world is a 32 year old female that makes 40 to $60,000 a year. That's your number one buyer because when you put out content by law of attraction, it's relatable, entertaining, and educational, and they start responding, a, a 20, uh, is 24 to 34, 25 to 35 uh, female is the most reactionary demo online. So if I've established this foundation by law of attraction and I put out content and understanding that demo, I'm going to know how people are going to react. So if I have if I have a business or a, a celebrity that has a 90% female fan base compared to uh, a business or person that has a 50-50. So when you, you know, in the marketing world, this is how I'm going to eliminate marketing. In the marketing world, they have an ABCD process. And you can't apply that to each demo because it's not going to work. So if you don't take the factors in that, this 50-50 over here may be just as good of a product or may be just as good of an entertainer. You've got to understand that your conversion is going to be slower because of the 50% male, because males wait. They usually wait two weeks out, a week out to buy something, right? That's just how they respond to shit online. So if you understand those behaviors on two different pieces of the puzzle, it's two different types of understanding and it's two different types of ways to build a business or, you know, build a career. Right. So if you don't understand those demos while you're building your, your found, bringing your people into your house, your numbers into your house, building that foundation, that's where the mistakes are made just in that first step. Right. Cause you, you know, you can apply marketing to both of those. And this one over here will fail and they will push that to the side, even though they still might have been a great talent or great business. They just didn't approach it the right way. Right. Hmm. So then, so then when you as you walk through this process and you fine tune finding a perfect audience, the second phase is is tone and timing. So you have established your demo. You understand what that is. You start to communicate with a certain tone. So law of attraction, tone will attract tone. You know, you hang out with people 
that have your friends are people that have a very similar tone to you, right? And in the, and then the timing is the choices you make, right? When you want to talk to this person, when you want to communicate, whatever it is, because all those the the foundation, the sensitivities, tone, and timing, all those align to when you need to talk to them with timing, right? And then as you go on, you try to perfect it more. And the last phase is emotions and landscape. So if you've built the foundation the right way, by law of attraction, you didn't have to sell them anything, you know, and you look at emotions, this, this is where all the mistakes are made. In our life, we make all our bad decisions when we get emotional. And when you start to get these emotional responses in business, People, these CEOs want to have these knee jerk reactions, you know, and they have these knee jerk reactions because they haven't built their foundation the right way. And it's like a rocky ship. But if you built your foundation the right way by law of attraction, when these emotional responses happen with your customers, you don't have a knee jerk reaction. You just use these as your micro fixes. So, and you continue to do this process continually, right? As you continue and you perfect, you know, a perfect customer. Because I'm a because my process will eliminate the bad customer. You know, if you eliminate the bad customer, then you only have a good customer, right? So, and, and, and then that's landscape at the end. That's full functionality, just like in life. You know, that's full functionality in life. You know, like we get to a certain point in life where we do the same thing. Because we worked this shit out. We've survived. We're still alive. We did all the partying or whatever. But now here's my full functionality. So this is how linear this process is to life, to business, whatever. This is, li this is linear to anything and everything. And this could reset. This could rebirth or birth anything and everything. So uh, I, I like your use of the word tone. Um and it reminds me of um, uh, was it resonant frequencies? Uh, you ever see the the opera singer that uh, has the glass and she can change her pitch of her voice to get that resonant frequency that oscillates with the glass that it breaks, or like the the tuning forks where you see like the the guy on one side of the room has a tuning fork that's tuned to the same frequency as a tuning fork on the other side of the room, and all of a sudden that tuning fork that's on the complete opposite side of the room starts playing the same frequency because it's aligned with the frequency of the person or the topic or the frequency of the other tuning fork across the room. Um, and I, I don't know what it is about that, that visual or that model that, that stands out to me, but it, it relate it's relatable on so many different areas and and your your use of the word tone and developing a pure uh, fan base or or um content yeah. platform and, and, and customer base yeah. and building that uh, foundation first without going out and hiring bots and 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 building you know a million followers that don't really care they just hit that like button if you get that foundation and you get that frequency going, it's going to build and build and build and build. And and before long, it's going to just explode. And I, I, we've kind of taken that approach with, with our podcast here. We haven't, we've never gone out and paid for advertising. We've never gone out and done anything. We've just kind of put our content out there and it's really cool to see it starting to kind of take on its own life. And, and, and people are, it, it, we doubled our numbers in a two week period with, without doing a thing. And it's interesting to see that happen. And so I'm, I'm kind of really excited to, to see if that uh, resonant frequency continues with us or, you know, how, how things will progress in the next five years. And so I, I really like your approach. I really like um, the thought of, not forcing it, but letting it grow on its own. Well, and I just wanted to add on to that too, that, you know, I, I mean, your example of the tuning fork and stuff is really interesting because I mean, I think to the point we were making earlier about the simpler way is the better way. 
even as we're talking about the law of attraction, we're talking about these things. Like, I mean, all, all the stuff that, that John is sharing with us is like, it makes perfect sense. Right. I mean, obviously you need to be in the same, you know, in, in this metaphor frequency to, you know, be in the right way of talking to a select audience, whoever that is. Right. And I mean, I know some people kind of poo poo this law of attraction idea, but the, the point is you're actually getting back to kind of nature, right? You're getting back to kind of just the natural laws of living. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, so the resonance and the, and the, the tuning fork metaphor, I think is a really interesting example because that's just a, just a, a, a fact of life. It's just a thing. Nobody manufactured that nobody, nothing. It's just, this is a reality that when these two things are on the same frequency, they connect. And, uh, and I think that that's just part of being human and part of life and all that stuff. So I think, you know, really distilling down our message to the fact that so much is just about being human and sort of like working in a natural way, uh, instead of all this sort of flashy marketing, you know, wah, wah kind of stuff, I think is, uh, is a really interesting way of looking at marketing. You know, because it's certainly not, I, I think, the way that they teach it or the way that people behave. Well, this is what's weird is, I mean, basically, I mean, I'm a clairsentient and, you know, I have a lot of information. I mean, I don't want to ruin a business thing, but basically, uh, I mean, it's quantum physics, you know, basically what I'm doing. And I didn't realize it was quantum physics, but the, but how I developed this system was I would say these words, I would say the word foundation, I would say the word environment. And and I have a link on my website. If you Google finding a perfect audience, I have an infographic that breaks all this down. But I would say environment, I would say foundation, I would say sensitivities, I would say tone, I would say timing, right? I would talk about emotions. So I had all these words that I would say, and I was like, why am I saying this? And I was walking on the beach and I said, how could I put them in order? Um, and there's, I put them in order. It's almost like the seven chakra. There's seven, there's seven things here, but this, and then I, when I dug even deeper, this is actually linear. I mean, the, the linear is linear to the universe. You know, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but this process is linear to the universe. And I never knew that I was doing quantum physics. I mean, that was a whole new thing for me. But that's basically how the, I mean, this thing came out of thin air, basically. Well, and I think that's the thing I'm trying to second or sort of say in support of what your message is, is that, you know, by sort of uncovering these like natural truths, right? Instead of fighting against it and trying to do things our way by God, you know, by tuning into the way the stuff just works, uh, I think we're better able to sort of capitalize on these things, right? I mean, it, you know, you you said at the top that, you know, social media channels were sort of created, you know, as a study of human nature. But I think at some point they delineated from human nature, right? Initially, the the concept was creation or, or uh, creating and maintaining relationships and building connections with other people. And I think that at some point, those those channels, either because they needed to make ad revenue or whatever, so at some point they deviated from that path. But what it sounds like anyway is that your your approach to building your perfect audience is really smack back at the core of maybe where those things started at. But more than that, it's just kind of the way stuff works. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, and two, you know, you're talking about the platforms, but see these platforms now these platforms now have enough data. So what you're saying, you know, about this connective, connective process, yes, when they initially started, it was a connective process. But now that they have enough human behavior data, they can isolate behaviors and by design, right, create a process that is going, they know that will push people's mindsets a certain way mm -hmm. right and i and i think to some extent you know if you look at what you know it's the same thing of when we're born if you have enough data let's say if there's only 10 bloodlines in the world and they have enough data on each bloodline right and they know whatever they throw at each of those bloodlines they they know how they're going to respond and that is by design. So if you have a big enough number of anything, you can predict anything because every, you know, everything you're talking about the quantum physics, 
you know, from the universe down. This is all mathematical, mm -hmm. you know, and that's what, you know, that's what we got away from. You know, this is math, a mathematical thing. Um, believe it or not, even with all the bullshit and all this, I mean, there's a lot of not, and I'm not going to go down too many rabbit holes here, but there's a lot of nonsense that, uh, people know about that is created for a purpose because they know how people are going to respond to it. Yeah. Uh, well, there's... and that might be sort of that weaponization of social, right? This is people playing yeah. on those realities and playing on these different tools. You know, I mean, if they can jump into Facebook and, and pull some data that will show, Hey, I want to influence people one way or the other. I guess that power can be used for good and evil. Well, yeah. there was the the first iteration. Of the iPhone didn't have the um, the green dot that came up and said that your uh, your camera's being used, and you could go into Instagram or other platforms like that. And once you authorize use of the camera, they could actually do facial recognition as you're scrolling through the uh, the feed and determine based off of facial recognition, if you like what you're seeing or if you don't like what you're seeing, and they can change that in accordance to what you're going through and they'll change your feed accordingly. And um, iPhones and, and other platforms have since put a green dot to let you know that your camera's being used so they can't really do that anymore. But um, it's it's very intriguing to me that they can, they can literally look at your reactions and look at what's going on and change what they're feeding you real lifetime. And uh, I don't know, it, it, social media is a, a double-edged um, sword and I've got my own thoughts on it. And I, I personally, um, yeah, won't go down that rabbit hole either, but uh, the weaponization oh, but of it is real. Yeah, to your point, I mean, I would just argue, I mean, it's the whole reason that we do business the way do we do business in our little agency is I didn't like the vibe or the feeling or the emotions it evoked to do advertising that felt like I was tricking people into buying stuff. And this was the kind of stuff that I've done for for clients and stuff in the past that was, you know, hey, I just need work to make ends meet, whatever, you know, so I was doing that kind of work. And it just, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't, you know, resonate emotionally in a very good way. And, uh, and so we evolved away from that. Right. So, I mean, there's always going to be somebody willing to do the bad thing, but I think, you know, to build a truly sustainable and a, you know, effective business, I think doing it the right way is obviously the better way to go. Well, if people realize, I mean, I know businesses or whoever want to want a customer no matter what, but if you think about the time and effort, if you could eliminate the bad customer, right. Eliminate that completely out of your business how much time and effort is put into that and how much cost is behind that. I bet you it's over, you know, a bad customer is over 50% of most businesses because there's a lot of time and effort needed to handle that. And the only reason they, you know, businesses hang on, hang on to that bad customer is because they think they need the money. When in actuality, if they just let the bad customer go, and focused on the pure source customer, you're going to save money. You're going to have more time. And it's, you know, and, and that's how going back to what I said earlier, that's how you get your business to consciousness. You know, the bad customer keeps you in an unconscious bias state. Right. But if you eliminate the bad customer, a business can truly get to consciousness. Yeah, I love that. And I think maybe that's a good spot to leave it. So, John, we're sort of at the end of the show. You want to let people know where they can learn more about your book, more about uh, your process and, and the, the way that you approach business? Yeah, I mean, I just try to be as authentic as possible and as real as possible. And, and this I'm very fortunate to have been able to come up with this information and, and, and I've applied it to my own success and it works. And um, if you're looking at anything out there, I mean, our company website is Bang Productions with an S TV dot com. You can check us out there. You can find me on Instagram at John E. Cosma. That's K-O-Z-M-A. Um, yeah, just Google John Edmonds Cosma, uh, if you will. And there's you can pl find plenty of information out there about what's going on with us and who we are. Love it. Well, thank you so much, John, for taking the time to do this. I, I really appreciate it. I think uh, it's always fun to, I mean, because, you know, we do a lot of these interviews. And so it's a lot of fun to get a different take. And sort of the business as usual kind of approach 
and yeah. uh, and I think the way that you broke it down made for a really interesting conversation. So thanks so much for taking the time. Cool. Well, I appreciate y'all having me on. Y'all got it dialed in out there in the what Midwest? Is that what it's called? Y'all in the yeah. Midwest? <laughs> yeah, we're uh, Idaho and Utah. Cool, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And thanks so much to everybody who tunes into the show this week and every week. See you guys next.